Welcome to all joining us today. Greetings from Boston, Massachusetts. I am Brent Shea from the class of 1978, and I'm honored to serve as president of the Williams College Society of Alumni. We've got a wonderful cross-section of the Williams family gathered here today, including undergraduate alumni, CDE, art history grad program alumni, and parents and family audience members. Thank you all for being here for today's Zoomcast with President Maud S. Mandel, now in her sixth year of service. Our conversation will, as always, offer us a chance to hear directly from Maud. She plans to share her perspective on campus life, the ongoing implementation of the strategic plan, and a handful of topics she has identified as being important to illuminate. And then, time permitting, we'll open the conversation for your questions. A few reminders before we dive in. Please use the chat as a space to engage with the community and share any reflections or comments you may have. If you have questions for Maud, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom toolbar at any time during today's talk. We'll dedicate the time as permitted to Q&A, and you can submit your questions as you think of them. So let's get started. Question one, Maud, can you please take us with inside the purple bubble? Um, we, we appreciate all the questions that we provided, and we'll cover the wide range of topics in the hour, but can you provide a brief overview of the start of the semester on campus for those of us at a distance outside of the purple bubble. Yes, of course. First of all, welcome to everybody. It's always wonderful, even in this uh, funny Zoom landscape we live in, to have an opportunity to get together. It's always great to see you, Brent. I prefer the three-dimensional view, but it's nice to see you here <laughs> as well. Um, and uh, and a hearty hello to folks tuning in from all over. Um, so uh, I'll, let me just begin you know, with a couple of stories from the campus um, in a typical uh, start of a year. Obviously, um, there's been uh, wonderful energy on campus as we started to go um, into the uh, semester this year. Um, and there are a couple of new things that have happened and some events on campus. And then um, maybe I'll just say a, a word about global events as well. Um, this fall has seen the launch of our new Global Scholars Program. Um, for those who are not aware of this program, it was one of the ideas that emerged out of our strategic planning process to create a cohort-based learning program for uh, sophomore applicants who uh, would enter the program and as part of it would uh, travel through um, for the next three years with a group of students. Um, who are interested particularly in uh, expanding their global knowledge and global research skills. Um, and uh, it begins with so, um, an introductory seminar that um, the students all take together. Then there's a joint winter study uh, course. This year it's going to be in Paris um, in January. And then the students are supported in language study and uh, research skills as they continue to work um, global a global focus into their entire rest of their Williams education and particularly potentially into honors theses. It's been really exciting to see this kick off. Uh, we had um, well over 70 applicants for a program with 12 slots just out of one class. Uh, that was out of last year's first year class, the rising sophomores. Uh, and um, I had the wonderful opportunity of hosting a gathering to celebrate the launch of this program uh, this fall um, and uh, and to engage with the students and student mentors who are involved in it. So that's been really exciting. Um, in addition, we, Steve and I, uh, my husband and I have relaunched our faculty salon series that we started last year where we bring faculty to our home to share uh, in, a, at a, in a dinner program with other faculty, a little bit of their research or teaching for their colleagues. And um, I'd like to talk about this program because uh, it's one that really allows the faculty to engage in the liberal arts education that our students get to take advantage of. That is to speak to a room full of non 
specialists in their field about something that they're reading or thinking about or working on or teaching. Um, we've done quite a number of these so far to uh, each time to about uh, a group of about 20 faculty. Uh, we've done one so, so far this year. We have another one coming up. Um, and it's actually been one of the real bright spots of the last couple of years to see faculty talking uh, across discipline and specialization to each other and enjoying the pleasure of being in a learning community that is itself um, a liberal arts uh, environment for our students, but also for them. Um, so that's been uh, that's been really terrific. Of course, we had a particularly joyous Mountain Day uh, this year, celebrating our retirement of uh, Scott Lewis, who has been at Williams for over, I believe, over thirty five years now. He's um, this was his last uh, formal Mountain Day in the role, um, and we we somehow hit the jackpot with the weather that day. So that was a wonderful uh, celebratory. Um, event and really, I I um, I just saw uh, so much joy as students uh, navigated the various activities and the picnic on the lawn, and that was uh, that was uh, quite wonderful. Um, in terms of uh, other things going on on campus, some of you have been following. I know the. Um, the story of the uh, athletics facilities here um, last spring, our um, field house, uh, it was determined would need to be closed uh, due to um, some structural concerns with uh, the facility. We had known that this building needed um, attention uh, and would likely have to be taken down. Um, and in fact, the strategic, the strategic plan had a big emphasis on our entire wellness um, athletics and physical education infrastructure built into it. Um, so that decision was planned, although it wasn't planned for last spring. But because of that, we decided to move forward uh, quickly with the demolition of the town field house. So that is now scheduled for um, right after homecoming weekend, which is coming up, uh, that building will be taken down. And in its stead, um, we all, two things are happening. The first is the board has approved the construction of a multi-purpose resource uh, recreation center, which will be uh, uh, right near the current tennis courts, um, and will operate as an interim field house until we work on a more long-term solution. And then that structure will be used for other purposes here at Williams related to our physical education, wellness, and athletics um, program. Um, and then in the meantime, uh, we have also had approval from the board um, and thanks to a very generous gift from an alum uh, to start um, constructing a, a longer term solution to our entire wellness and, wellness and athletics um, infrastructure. Uh, and so we have a program study that we're engaging in now. That's uh, That will take a longer period of time to move that project forward, um, but will that will bring us towards a more permanent solution of, uh, of the field house. So those are some of the things going on. I, I might just say, though, that um, the fall has obviously been affected also by um, world events. Um, and everybody on this call knows that um, following the terrorist atrocities uh, in Israel on October 7th, um, the specter of war in the Middle East and um, conflict uh, in that far away place has had a very direct impact on college campuses across the country um, and also here at Williams. Um, and I, I so I, maybe just a moment, since I know a number of questions came in about how the campus climate's been affected, I might just uh, note that um, certainly the campus has been affected. It would be impossible, I think, to uh, be um, alive in the United States or really anywhere in the globe right now and not be um, very focused on what's happening there. Um, and uh, there has certainly been um, student, some student, um, energy and activism around support for uh, Palestinians. There's been um, uh, a number of other um, uh, efforts among Jewish students and others to bring attention to what's going on in the region. I do want to say that relative to what's happening on other campuses, it's fairly calm here. There's certainly uh, been some back and forth uh, between students, but um, uh, oh, the, I would say the overwhelming um, energy on the campus has been uh, positive, um, broadly speaking. Uh, we had a vigil a uh, few days after the um, events on October 7th. It was an ecumenical vigil um, that was co-hosted by all four of our chaplains, our uh, rabbi, our um, 
our Muslim chaplain, our um, Catholic and our um, uh, Episcopalian chaplain, and they collectively hosted uh, the conversation uh, for uh, a, a, a very nice sized turnout of mostly students, but also some staff and faculty uh, to mourn um, losses uh, in the Middle East. Um, and so uh, we've been doing what we can behind the scenes to support students who have families whose lives have been disrupted um, or, or touched directly and indirectly um, and, and who feel very deeply about what's going on there. And so that's obviously affected our experience here on camp and as has uh, the events in Maine last week uh, when campuses were uh, on lockdown um, uh, due to the very upsetting uh, shooting environment, shooter experience that took place there. Uh, and of course, we have students here who have siblings and friends uh, that were in Maine. So there's been the outside world has definitely had an impact about uh, on life here on the campus. Um, we don't go untouched in these moments, but we're trying to do what we can to support students uh, outside the classroom and very much inside the classroom. And I should note, we have a number of courses uh, that deal directly with events in the Middle East. And in fact, I was just talking to a student today about her experiences in her Middle East history class and how grateful she is for that class and how much she's been learning um, in a really good environment where there's been really good discussions uh, in that class. Uh, Ma, just continuing a little bit on, more on this topic, um, I, I wanna say um, it was noteworthy uh, a few weeks ago that you did not put out an institutional statement in response to the horrific attacks by Hamas on Israelis and the death of Palestinian civilians in the military retaliation. Instead, you shared a community message explaining your practice not to issue such statements on current events. And I was wondering if you would share a little bit more with us about your thinking. Uh, yes, I would. And thanks for the question, Brent. I so I've gotten a lot of questions and a lot of feedback um, on that decision. Um, and I, for those of you who haven't followed this as closely, you'll know that um, right after um, the October 7th events, uh, I didn't say or do anything for a couple of days. And I got a lot of questions about my silence on that. So that's when I put out the statement explaining why I hadn't put out a statement. Um, I should say that decision not to put out a statement reflected a decision I'd actually made over a year ago. Um, and I, when I didn't put out a statement uh, after Russia invaded Ukraine, um, and uh, many colleges and universities did um, and have been for a long time. I too, uh, for years um, after I got to Williams, my first few years, put out a number of statements about national and global events. Uh, but I had come to recognize uh, really through a lot of deep reflection, reading what other presidents um, and other professional communicators and others have said about institutional statements, that were, there were some real challenges um, with colleges and universities weighing in on global and national events, unless they had a direct impact on our campus, by which I mean policies in Washington that affect how we do our business. Um, Beyond that, uh, what I had was increasingly realizing about these statements is that, first of all, every time I put them out and sort of asserted that I was speaking for Williams, the first thing that would happen is many people would write me to tell me how, in fact, I didn't speak for them, that this wasn't their view, that they didn't share my perspective. Uh, so that was quite interesting. I was also deeply aware of how many times nobody asked me to put out a statement, but about really terrible things, really big atrocities, uh, some small, some very big, uh, all all around the globe. Um, and uh, because those weren't sort of visible to an American audience for whatever reason, um, I wasn't getting uh, those kinds of um, appeals, but actually uh, it was quite uneven and in fact did affect people here at Williams uh, because we have a global population here. But I think most importantly, what governed that decision was a, a, a belief that I've been coming increasingly solidified around, which I've always thought, but really sort of articulated in the sentence that I wrote in that statement about how what I'm really here to do, what we're here to do is to teach people how to think, not what to think. Um, and that, and that's why I really, I mentioned that class that, that the uh, students wanting to learn and engage with what's happening in our world are doing that best in classes with specialists who have deep knowledge uh, and then can in, uh, 
provide them with the evidence um, to really engage uh, with the world around them. And so um, I, I like to think of this as a principled decision. Um, it's also one that reflects my own view as a learner. Uh, I, I haven't stayed in one place with this view. I've evolved over time as I've learned more about what it is to be a president and, and honestly, what it is to be part of Williams, because Williams is a very particular kind of place um, and, and one where I think this approach um, uh, really reflects the ethos of what we think about a liberal arts education, what we think about learning. Um, and so, so it was really with all those pieces in mind that uh, I came to that decision. Well, well that, that's great. And it's, and it's actually very helpful for us to hear. So, so thank you. Um, as, as a follow-up, um, I had a, a pre-submitted question that that's, that's related. And the alum asked, um, I have a concern about the recent responses of various campuses to what appears to be free expression. Do the principles put together in the last few years really work? Or do we need some other way to have the college community feel safe in expressing minority views? No, it, it's a really good question, and one I think campuses are grappling with right now um, here and across the country, which is, on the one hand, here at Williams, as we put out in a statement um, in 2019, we believe deeply in free expression. It is, in fact, the building blocks of uh, higher education. Um, campuses, as everybody knows, have struggled really for years now with trying to figure out how to ensure that we can guarantee free expression when there are multiple points of view uh, and when people often disagree strongly and emotionally. Um, and uh, and we continue to struggle uh, with with um, how to support uh, our, a very diverse student body and uh, professional body, um, even in moments when they really disagree with each other and sometimes are quite angry with each other in that disagreement. So that's on the one hand. On the other hand, in our statement in 2019, we also said we're really interested in building uh, an inclusive community and one where people feel like they belong. And, and I'll just honestly say to you, and in this environment, sometimes those two principles clash with each other. Supporting free expression sometimes means that people on the campus feel like they don't belong, or they feel marginalized, or they feel um, uh, alienated or lonely, or some of the words I sometimes hear, or afraid. Uh, they they feel they feel uh, fear sometimes. Um, and so it's really that balance of trying to allow for the widest range of expression. Um, free expression really does protect a very wide range. Certainly the, the amendment does, but even on our campuses, we're trying to support the widest range of exchange of views while simultaneously trying to build a community where people feel that they can live comfortably uh, with whatever views they have. I, I want to say something really specifically about the second half, because I think sometimes when I say we're building a community of belonging, that what people assume that means is that we're trying to do everything possible to ensure that people never feel uncomfortable um, or, or have to confront a view they disagree with. And that's not what we mean. What we mean when, we're build, when we say we're building a community of belonging is we mean we put a lot of support in place to um, provide students with the opportunity either to find solace and community when they're feeling is somewhere in the campus, when they're feeling perhaps alienated by another part of it. So uh, affinity groups and clubs and um, entries and places where people feel like they have a lot of support where they can go to on the campus, first of all. And second of all, to provide them with the resources to help them learn how to express themselves. So sometimes the very, not always, but sometimes the very best way to, uh, to learn how to engage is to do so by figuring out what your own argument is in a particular moment. And unfortunately, sometimes as you articulate that, what you really do is anger somebody else. And that's just, the re that's you know particularly visible at the moment um, across uh, many campuses. We obviously want, we would never allow, we don't allow harassment of individuals. We're not gonna allow inciting of violence on the campus. We're not gonna do anything that endangers anybody here. But we are we are trying within those boundaries to um, to to allow for free expression. So um, just sort of continuing on your sense of community and belonging, um, we are now a full year into the implementation of the college's first in the nation all grant financial aid program. A year later, 
What have we learned so far about the impact of that program on student experiences? Uh, thank you for the question. So you know, Brent, that this is a program that I'm really enthusiastic about. I'm very excited to have been able to um, expand on William's long uh, history, which I hope every alum listening is very proud about, uh, to um, lean into access and affordability. And this was really the next chapter in that history. Uh, we have done uh, quite a bit of studying our own population to, uh, as, as one does in higher ed um, through uh, surveying and other kinds of ethnographic research to figure out how the um, first year of this program has gone. And um, really it's a, it's a very good news. Um, nine, so just to give you some data behind that, 95% 4% of all aided students have report, have reported that all grant had a positive effect on their experience. So that's, you know, very, very hard to get 94% of students to agree on anything. If you want to go back to my last, <laughs> my last comment. Um, so to have 94% of aided students say that it has positively affected their experience is really, really wonderful. Um, in addition, 77% uh, of first years reported that all grant was one of the main reasons they chose to attend Williams, which is quite interesting as we differentiate ourselves in the landscape um, around, and I know we'll, I'm sure, get to talking about admissions uh, eventually, but um, is one of the, the things that Williams has uh, that, that we offer that is distinctive from our peers um, and that uh, allows us to attract a broad and diverse uh, student body. 70% um, of those we uh, spoke to reported a decrease in the number um, who took out loans because of all grant. Uh, that's an obviously perhaps not a, a shocking outcome when you remove grants from the packaged loans of uh, students on financial aid, but it's really great news. And I know that um, many families were, were very grateful uh, for that. Um, the other thing I, I just wanted to know, because people have often asked about um, the impact on work study, and I know some alumni were a little bit nervous about removing work study from the package, thinking that work for you when you were on campus and your friends was a big part of your um, of your education, indeed, uh, we we are um, strongly in favor of encouraging students to work. Uh, th this doesn't really remove that; it just uh, allows them to pocket their own earnings uh, from that work and direct it to their own families uh, and their own personal needs, or even uh, some savings if we're lucky um, as they move forward to think about the next phase of their education. But I can tell you that um, one over uh, thirteen hundred students chose to hold campus jobs last year after all grant was established. So, um, and that just gives you a sense that many, many, many students on Will at Williams are working and actually the numbers haven't changed dramatically. What changed dramatically, not dramatically, but what did change was the number of hours students were working. Um, and that's also a great outcome because it means they're still learning the lessons and doing um, what they need to do to, to supplement their, their own and their family's incomes. Um, but they feel they have a little more elbow room in order to uh, take that uh, harder class or to um, participate in a cap and bells production or um, to take in the summer a no paid or low paid internship in civil service or uh, education or government or not for profit work which is often um, not possible if somebody feels like they had to make a lot of money so that they could pay it back to Williams. So um, so the, the the news is good. It's, it's new. Uh, it's still, I consider this in early days, uh, and we will continue to um, track the impact on our students as we go forward. Uh, uh, thanks. And, and you're right, it is just early days, but it's terrific to hear that. Um, one of the major initiatives in the college's uh, 2021 strategic plan is arts at Williams. And with its centerpiece project being the construction of a new Williams College Museum of Art on the site where the old Williams then used to be, uh, could you share an update on the project and why it is so important to Williams to pursue now? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that question. Um, this project is also very dear to my heart. And people ask me this question a lot, um, you know, why a museum? And, and it really is, it feels important for me to explain first and foremost, uh, the centrality of this part of our college, of this institution, um, in, in the way it supports the whole campus community. So I just want to give you a little bit, a couple of statistics. So 57% um, of our graduates over the last four years took at least one art course. Um, 
And in the 2022-23 academic year, 130 different courses, just take that in, 130 different courses from across all three academic divisions used the museum and its collection at some point in the course. So this is an institution that is at um, the center of our academic interdisciplinary life and faculty from every department, um, chemistry, environmental science, computer science, art history, of course, history, dance, all of these departments draw on the collection uh, for part of what they're trying to teach. 36 of those 130 courses use something we call the object lab, which is our hybrid gallery classroom. Uh, in order to display art and bring their actual classes in to work with the collection. Um, 83 use our Rose Study Gallery to look at particular pieces uh, of artwork. Um, and I, I think I want to, to the why now question, I want to just say two things. First of all, in many ways, I see this building project as a stake in the ground for um, the liberal arts and what I think of as the interdisciplinary liberal arts. That is, you're hearing lots of uh, concern across the country about humanities. I don't think we have that concern at Williams. We have very robust humanities um, courses uh, and engagement, but, um, but there's no question that even here at Williams, there's been a big tilting to the STEM fields over the years. Um, and so coming, using these interdisciplinary courses in ways that get students thinking about and using art in their learning, no matter what field they're in, is really for us a, a way of continuing to make clear the significance of, that we think of the humanities for all of the things we learn. So we want chemists to be thinking about pigmentation and artwork, right? That's why maybe one of our chemistry classes is using the art, which is quite different from an environmental studies course that's using it to think about um, landscapes, for example, just to use two examples. Um, we uh, And so that's a very big part, um, but it's also true that Williams has a long and storied history uh, in the arts um, and, uh, and particularly in art history. Uh, we have a graduate program, Small But Mighty in Curation, which has made um, a huge impact in the world, uh, in the arts world. Uh, hardly You can hardly go to a museum that doesn't have a, someone from Williams working there, um, which is the, the legacy of that program. And WICMA has been here for 100 years. Uh, it's, this is marking its anniversary, the, this rebuild. Um, and uh, the current building, Lawrence Hall, which we all love and will continue to use for other things, but it's it's not a very good envelope for art. It's uh, and so we want to build a facility that will keep that art safe and allow future generations of Williams students to be able to learn as so many of you did uh, in using that collection. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Now, I'd like to continue with some of the pre-submitted questions from alums. And um, as you actually made reference to earlier, the next one's on admissions. We received a number of questions from alumni that relates to this topic and particularly coming out of last spring's Supreme Court decision. What is Williams doing with respect to admissions in the, in the fast changing landscape? Um, yes, another another way in which the outside world has very much affected uh, life on our campus. So, um, so as I think everybody listening knows, uh, the Supreme Court made a decision in June uh, to no longer um, allow any kind of race based admissions in um, college admissions processes. Um, and what I wrote out then, and this is an example of a time I would write out because it was a national policy that had a direct impact on the college. And of course, what I said at the time and continues to be true and will always be true is that Williams will follow the law of the land. Um, and so, of course, we are uh, following um, what the Supreme Court has said we have to do, uh, and we are therefore adapting our um, policies uh, to match this new context. Diversity is and will remain a core value at Williams um, because uh, we really believe that learning and living with people from a variety of educational and personal backgrounds is at the heart of an educational enterprise. Um, and we will work within the bounds of the law uh, to ensure the promise of a great liberal arts education remains open to people of a wide variety of backgrounds uh, and perspectives. 
Um, I should note that as we figure out this new landscape, it is important to remind folks that admissions has never been one fixed thing. Um, Brent, when you went to college, you went through one kind of admissions process. When I went, uh, only a few years later, it was a rather different process. And now it's a very different process. So that's just the historian in me reminding everyone that admissions is constantly evolving, even if our goal is always the same, which is to get the very best students who want to come to Williams uh, here uh, to the college. Um, but we remain in an evolving uh, landscape as we've always been, and we continue um, to adapt to it. So our admissions team has been working very hard in this environment um, and to continue to um, uh, make sure that our practices adhere to the law, but also to continue to lean into um, all kind of, all the various ways we can to continue to uh, ensure and build uh, a diverse class. I should also note, um, many on the call may have heard that we developed a working group that includes trustees, faculty, and college administrators. And that group is charged with reviewing really all of the historical and current data around admissions, um, both our own data and our own experiences and also what's happening in the national landscape. Um, and the committee's work is really to guide and support the Board of Trustees and its consideration of how current admissions functions um, and uh, what the practices and policies are that uh, support our mission and our strategic plan. And I just want to reassure the audience because I, I know there were specific questions in, in your and that you were asking me. We didn't go into this work with any preconceived notion about um, how the college admissions program might change or even if it's going to change at all. Rather, um, it really fell in the category of things that, uh, of work that I think the board chair and I believed were very deeply um, in the board's purview, which is to regularly um, and deeply review uh, the sort of who we are and who we want to be. That's just a really big part of um, of any of the work that uh, that a college is doing at any moment and, um, and that its board should be heavily engaged in. Um, so this work wasn't meant to be some quick review. There, there isn't a predetermined decision that at the end I'm going to announce some big changes. It's really, as you know, from being in the boardroom, uh, an ongoing conversation where we educate ourselves about practices at Williams and elsewhere and just make sure we have the very best ones for Williams. That, that is good. Uh, thank you, Maude. Um, in a similar Williams way, we received a number of questions from alums that relate to sustainability. Hmm. So can you share more about the college's goals and commitments, and particularly as it relates to energy sourcing and how student dining ties hmm. into the college's overall approach to sustainability? Thank you. Great questions. Yeah. So um, in the strategic planning work that we did um, when I first got here, uh, one of the sort of key pillars that we built into the college and I always talk about this as our 10 to 15 year plan, so and and hopefully beyond, but it is the sort of the focus of these years. Um, one of the key pillars was on sustainability. And that was really um, focused uh, sort of in two, I mean, well, it's a multi-pronged focus, but I can divide it for the purposes of our conversation in, in two ways. One is sort of the education we offer, and we do have a growing number of environmental studies majors, students who affiliate with um, the Zilka Center uh, that supports sustainability work on campus in summer internships and work um, in uh, environmental studies and supporting um, the environment. And that's because we know that really the most important thing we can do is to continue to educate students who are going to leave here and go off into the world and make a difference in other arenas. And so uh, that's been a big part of our, um, our interest um, and effort. And then in addition to that, of course, we have a component that's focused on sort of how we live in the world as a campus. And I think the question you've asked is really more focused on that part of the work, which is um, how we heat and cool the campus, how do we source energy for it, in other words, um, and how we wind sustainability work into um, all parts of the college, dining being a really good example of one of the both the challenges and the places we've done a lot of work. So on the energy sourcing, what I would say is we are um, working right now on what I think of as a many year plan to prepare Williams from a transition away from any kind of fossil fuel uh, heating and cooling system um, 
And in order to do that, a, a tremendous amount of work needs to be done on preparing buildings and underground work um, and building up um, our electricity capacity. Um, and so we're in what I would think of as the first phase of that process, which is going to involve um, over time building a um, uh, an additional ener uh, electricity energy sourcing plant on the campus, and then also um, renovating dorms um, and buildings. But at, any new building we build prepares for a new world, uh, new ways and sources and thinking about heating and cooling. And then also some of the renovations that we'll do over the next few years will prepare buildings for that. Uh, in the meantime, we deal with some real problems. Um, you know, the electricity, the availability of electricity, even in this region um, will, uh, our needs will outpace uh, what's available um, in Berkshire County, for example. Uh, and so um, we, we can only move as fast as our environment in some ways, but we continue to do a variety of projects um, around geothermal um, exploration uh, and others to test what will be possible as we move forward. So I think, again, I think of this as a multi-year project, but it's one that's well underway with an energy and carbon master plan. You can read all about it online if you want more details. Somebody asked specifically about dining. Um, one of the ways that building sustainability into all aspects of our work um, one of the ways that manifests itself is that when we hire, we really try to bring in people who um, have some consciousness and education and, and um, uh, abilities to move um, our processes and work forward in this area. So um, our head of dining uh, has been a really wonderful partner with the Zilka Center in trying to think about um, all kinds of ways that dining can support um, uh, sustainability work from um, composting uh, to making sure that we don't, to the extent possible, over purchase to um, where we source food from. Um, and, and it's really very much a part of the practice of dining, increasingly so. Um, and then, of course, there's a lot of education that has to happen around campus because just because you, for example, provide receptacles into which people can do composting and you know it doesn't it doesn't always work the way you want it to and so we're also doing a lot of work with students actually and we're always trying to wind students in um, to this work so uh, so I hope that gives a, a little bit of a flavor of some of the work that's taking place that that, that does that's great um, the, the next question is sort of a post Williams question comes and it's can you share how Williams is helping students showcase to employers how a liberal arts background are relevant to adding value and creating change in today's world. Yes, so um, the, the I, I always like to say I'm, I'm sort of take back a, take a step back from the question before I answer it. I, I all, many of you have probably heard me say that I think a liberal arts education is the most pre-professional degree that you can have, and that's because it prepares students for an ever-changing world. It prepares them how to think. It prepares them with transferable competencies writing, researching, problem solving, data analysis. Uh, you've all, many of you have heard me say these things. I know you know it to be true because I know that you graduated from Williams and used those skills as you went on uh, into the next phases of your lives and careers, all of which are very impressive <laughs> for my engagement with you. Uh, and, and so I, I know what you've gone on to do. Uh, we, we still do that work here. And so we're preparing students that way. I understand that wasn't really the question, but I, 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 I just, I like to double down on the power of a liberal arts degree in a pre-professional setting. Having said that, yes, um, it, we need the question is really about how do we help students understand how to talk about that to um, potential employers. Um, and there, one of the big changes at Williams, I think, um, that really started before I got here, but it's been accelerating, is the work of our uh, um, Career Exploration Center. The Career Exploration Center is uh, appropriately named um, with an emphasis on career exploration. And so what we try to do is to get our first year students. When I was in college, if you went to the Career Service Center, you went as a senior. I have to say to this day, I have no idea where it was on my campus. I don't think I ever set foot in it. It was, a, it was very much targeted for a very small subset of the campus. It wasn't well supported and nobody knew about it. Um, but at Williams, what we try to do is get first year students to come in so that every year in their winter study, sometimes if they're off campus or in their summers, they're doing different um, 
exploratory work to figure out what they're good at, what they're interested in. I often say first jobs are about learning what you don't want to do, not what you do want to do, and to get the mentoring about um, how to talk about their education uh, in the way the question was posed for future employers with cover letters and resumes to be sure, practice interviewing, um, but also, and very importantly, engagement with alumni. And, and through our EFLINK platform, we try to encourage students to reach out to you, uh, those of you listening and, and well beyond, so that the students can talk to folks who've been working in the field, yes, in particular fields, yes, obviously students are looking for jobs, so they might say, do you have any internships? But really the main goal for us is to get some mentoring in order um, for you to help them learn how to uh, communicate in those ways and put themselves in the best light and reach out to contacts and learn how to network. And then once they're in front of somebody say, let me explain how my paper on the invasion of Afghanistan really prepared me for the work world. Um, and it did, right? I mean, those writing skills and those researching skills and there's assessing of evidence and all of that is, really powerful. And so uh, and so we use that, we use the 62 Center, obviously faculty, and definitely our alumni partners um, to help students prepare in that way. Uh, the next question that's popped up is that it's from an alum who was recently on campus and saw the Davis Center construction and noted that it was progressing well. They asked, when will it be done and when it is done what will happen there how will it contribute to the community building you've talked about today thank you great question project i'm also very excited about um in part because we were able to move it forward through one of the worst moments in williams history which was the pandemic of course uh, and that's a project that thanks to some tremendously generous alumni supporters and some really hardworking staff here, uh, we have been able to stay moving forward in exactly the time frame uh, that we wanted to. And so the specific answer to the question is we will open uh, for business in January. So it's right around the corner. Um, and I believe the staff is moving in um, in late December and in and, and winter study. Um, and then students will be able to start using it when they uh, come back in the second semester. And that we're going to have a big celebration uh, in April, um, ribbon cutting ceremony a little later in when the weather's nicer um, and we can celebrate together. I've had a chance to tour uh, the facility in its current state. It's a beautiful building um, that is really targeted uh, architecturally to do what it's trying to do philosophically. So it, it has lots of big open spaces for students to meet. It has kit a kitchen, actually, uh, this is big space where two groups could be cooking at the same time on different sides of the kitchen, as one of the things we heard from students was around creating foods from um, a wide range of backgrounds and cultures that they want to share with their fellow students. Um, it has uh, uh, spaces to study and work but that are very beautiful. So um, there's a bridge, if some of you will notice, it, the building connects two, um, two separate buildings through a bridge, uh, but that bridge itself is a laptop bar and you can sit and look out at the mountain on one of the floors and the other, I think they're just comfortable chairs for, for just looking out at the at the beautiful view there. So, so it's really a place to, to, to build community. Um, and that gets to the, the meteor part of the question, how is it going to do that? So first of all, this is our multi, um, Multicultural center, and I, and I I really want to note the phrase multicultural. Um, the the Davis Center doesn't serve one subset of our student population. You know, we have a really diverse student body here, and the Davis Center supports um, that part of anybody who self-defines in a sense as affiliated with something that is uh, an affinity or a religious minority or first generation student or um, uh, LGBTQ students, or like we have a wide range of students that that are supported directly through programs in the Davis Center, clubs that are supported, staff that is working uh, to support them. And so I say that to say it's by def it's already a multicultural center. It's already bringing people together from a huge range of diverse backgrounds into conversation with each other um, and supporting them and engaging across difference. It also does a lot of outward facing work. So to uh, it also, the staff in particular that work there um, partner with other staff and faculty across the campus to continue to support 
what it means to live in a diverse community uh, and to dialogue across difference. And, and this, in a, in a sense, this echoes back to my first answer or my first comments earlier in the call, that's hard work. Uh, you know, there <laughs> we don't always all get along with each other. You bring a diverse group of people together, they sometimes disagree with what they think, but also they often just come from really different backgrounds. And um, sometimes those encounters can be jarring, actually, as people try to figure out um, what it means. Young people who haven't necessarily come from um, uh, communities that are particularly diverse are suddenly encountered with people from all over the globe and and trying to figure out what that means and how to talk to them and how to ask questions and how to live in community together. Uh, so the Davis Center really supports that work um, in the building and outside of the building. So um, so it's it's exciting and I look forward to, to celebrating it. Uh, as a follow-up to that question and, and to our earlier topics, um, We've received a few messages from current pa parents asking what we're doing to support Jewish students and what we're doing to make sure Williams stays a welcoming, inclusive community. Yeah, thank you. So, um, so first of all, thanks for the question. It's a very challenging time. There's a lot of anti-Semitism right now uh, on in the globe. Um, and uh, and in the country, um, and I know many of us are struggling with it. I know you all know I'm Jewish. Uh, I'm not just Jewish. I'm a, a professor of Jewish studies, uh, and I've spent a lot of time teaching courses um, related to this topic um, and thinking about it a great deal. So, um, so the first thing, I, let me just first say one high level point about this, which is that. Um, one of the things I've learned in my own research and writing, and I, I, I've written a book on Muslim Jewish relations in France, which is where most of my research was. And one of the many things that came through as I was doing the work uh, for that book was um, when violence and war break out in the Middle East, um, immediately anti-Semitism goes up in the world and Islamophobia goes up in the world, both happen. Um, and uh, they don't play out in the same way. They're very different forms of uh, bigotry and targeting, uh, but both happen. And the impact on our campus, and I know the question was about Jewish students, but I really actually want to just talk about um, uh, students from a, a wider variety of backgrounds as well who are touched by this. What happens on our campus is students and I'm just watching this happen in real time, feel isolated, um, targeted, unsupported by the college, scared, um, and, and lonely. Those are words I've heard. But what's interesting, and I have heard those from Jewish students, I've also heard it from Muslim students. So it's actually something that is um, a kind of a shared experience and a very hard one to address in a way that um, makes everybody feel equally supported. And that's partly why, and I'm, so I'm going back to my answer to the first question, that one of the ways that we support belonging and inclusion is making sure that students have staff support um, and faculty support. It's a little bit different, but staff support uh, in order to help them both um, process and be in community in difficult and challenging times. So we have uh, an entire building that supports Jewish community life on campus. We have a staff member, um, Seth Wax, whose uh, full-time job is to support those students here on campus, but also to partner with other chaplains um, on, uh, on that work. Um, and then uh, simultaneously, we have other folks here who are doing that work with other communities. And so um, that's one of the things we're doing. The other thing is I'm doing quite a bit of work. I'm trying to lean in with those communities. I have visited with uh, the Jewish uh, community in uh, private gathering after the terrorist attack in Israel. I went to uh, religious services this weekend. I sat down with Muslim students um, as well and heard some of their concerns with the Muslim chaplain. So to continue to make clear that even as the world becomes a dangerous and scary place, um, that um, that that they have friends and supporters and colleagues here who um, really care about them. And then the very last thing I'll say, I, I did say before, but it is it's just bears repeating that um, it's really in the classroom here where we can do a lot of um, really good work with students to help them do the most important thing, which is understand this incredibly complex moment in our world's history um, in, a, in a place where they can actually grapple with some of that, because a lot of what's happening, even in the language of targeting that's taking, is, is it's very sort of 
you know, activism is a very blunt instrument. It's very raw. It's very um, simplistic at some level. Um, and and what we're trying to do when we're teaching people to think and and um, understand their world is really to to go in deeper. And that work happens best in the classroom here. And I, I think it's happening well. Uh, another question we received asked for, about academics and the question is how is Williams approaching the proliferation and widespread use of AI tools such as large language models and in the context of defining and evaluating assignments that entail research writing editing and submitting work that is authored by students or teams um so AI is really, you know, every it's, it's funny how the world moves very quickly. And, you know, we're all talking about one thing for a few weeks and then we move on, then we move on to the next big challenge. But AI has, is probably, you know, one of the most seismic things to happen to higher education uh, of all the things we've talked about. Um, and uh, we are, we, you know, I also feel really in early days um, to fully understand what its impact is going to be on our workforces uh, and our educational models going forward. Um, here at Williams, we have a, a, a new, uh, also came out of our strategic planning work, a new teaching center um, that also generously supported by one of our wonderful alums who um, who's endowed the center. And that center is really shaping um, uh faculty professional development opportunities um, in, uh, you know, I like to think we have the very best educators at Williams, but um, they are constantly working on their perfecting their craft and uh, the teaching center is enabling them to do that. And it through the teaching center, one of the big topics they have really taken up is AI and how to work well with it in the classrooms themselves and how to, how to, um, support students with this very question around collaborative engagement um, and sort of when to use and how to use this as a tool to support your education uh, rather than as, as a crutch instead of an education. Um, and uh, one of the great things, um, I know we have parents on the call as well as alumni, one of the great things about a small liberal arts college is you tend to take, not all of them, but you tend to take really small classes. And when you're in a small class with a faculty member, um, the, I think it's much easier to engage with students uh, on what learning looks like. And faculty do that in a wide range of ways. And of course, students are using AI. They started using it the day it came out. That is actually you know, something we know from here and across higher education. Um, but our faculty are increasingly trying to figure out ways to say, well, let's use this as the tool, a tool the way um, a, uh, a mathematician might use a calculator uh, while still needing to understand the very basics of mathematics. Uh, and that's really, I think, what the effort is uh, going into here. Um, but it's, it's, um, it's, it's unending. I mean, this is the beginning of a journey uh, around these issues that I think will be really shaping the way we live and learn for, um, for many years to come. Um, Maude, we have an extraordinary campus and uh, another question around building, uh, the alum asks, um, are there any plans on the horizon for building new dormitories? Mm -hmm. New dormitories. Um, yeah. I, think that, I think I can answer that in the simplest of all my answers so far, no. I don't have any plans <laughs> right now to build any new dormitories. Um, we built Horn Hall. Uh, a couple of years ago, um, and that remains a very popular dorm. However, I do have plans <laughs> to renovate our current uh, dormitories. Um, that is also going to be a a, uh, a process. It's going to take many years to kind of work through our stock. You you all know we have lots of small dorms, not the big kind of institutional, with some exceptions, large dorms that other campuses have. Um, but and this is really linked right now to our sustainability work. Those two things go hand in hand. So as we bring dorms online for renovation, um, we, will, uh, we will also be addressing uh, what it will take to make them prepare, to prepare them, I guess is the way to say it, for uh, transitions and how we heat and cool buildings um, in the years ahead. Uh, but that work is, yes, that is actually actively being planned, um, uh, an approach to um, kind of systematic dorm renovations uh, that should start uh, in the next couple of years. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Um, so now I'm going to move, looking at the clock, I'm going to move to what I believe will be my final question. 
Um, we're deep into the fall here in New England. And as all of us who spent time in the Purple Valley know, winter is coming. Uh, I heard there are some changes being discussed for winter study. And mm. I was wondering if you could share more about what's under consideration. Oh, yeah, happy to. So um, that's another big project we've been um, working on for a number of years, uh, but we're doing some um, sort of some of the key work this year. So when I got here, there was a lot of conversation about winter study as a uh, very important part um, and a very um, beloved part of the Williams educational uh, landscape. I heard that from alumni, but I also heard it from students that students really enjoyed having a time here where um, it was a little bit a little bit less academically intense. There was still learning going on, but not quite at the um, high-pitched fever intensity of academic learning that seems to be the way in which uh, students engage most of the time um, during the academic year. Um, and so everybody, I think, had had a, a deep love um, for winter study, but I think there was also a sense that um, uh, that it was time uh, to refresh it a little bit, um, and particularly given really active interest these days in experiential learning um, and in thinking and sort of bringing thinking and doing together in the way that um, so much, uh, so many students are interested in sort of understanding how lessons they're learning on a campus can be put into some kind of applied problem solving uh, real world uh, scenario. And so um, so with sort of all of that in mind, um, we started to um, think about how we might refresh uh, the winter study program. Um, and that involved um, an initial uh, group sort of very much articulating what we see of as the goals of winter study. And that work was done two years ago. And that was, you can see that on the webpage, just sort of how we define and uh, align the types of courses we offer. Um, but now we're in much um, deeper work of rethinking some of the structures and approach to who teaches in winter study um, and, and what even those structures of the courses might be. So we, we, we understand how so many alumni like to participate in this program. We'd like to increase the opportunity for alumni to do it. I, I, I'm not at the end of this journey yet because I'm working with the faculty, but at least aspirationally, I'm working towards a model which might allow us to break up the three and a half week time frame. So maybe students could take a couple of short courses, which might allow more alumni to participate in for shorter periods of time, because not everybody can take off, say, three and a half weeks in January and move to Williamstown. So are there ways we can uh, sort of have the structures be um, a little bit more flexible um, so that we can allow students to uh, to interact more with uh, with our uh, alumni, we, you know, we really want faculty focusing on the things they do best. So we want the ones teaching in winter study who have real expertise um, and knowledge to share. And then we want others to work with students in other capacity on research and um, uh, course prep and the like. So, um, so we're 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 really taking a a broad overview. And one of the things we're also thinking about are what are some of the other things we could do in winter study around student wellness. Um, around financial literacy, sort of other things that we would love them to learn while they're here that don't really fall naturally into the two semester approach. So, and um, I think the last thing I'll say is uh, one of the, my own principles of the uh, strategic planning process was to think of the four years that somebody's at Williams is not as eight semesters, but really four years. And that includes winter study and summers, internships, um, and skill building that don't happen in the traditional um, semester framework. And so that's really kind of the ethos behind this thinking. Uh, and it feels like it's going in good directions. So very excited about uh, watching that evolve. And, and if anybody's listening and thinking, oh, I would love to teach a winter study of the kind you're talking about, I'm imagining um, it will take us until probably January of 26. So it's this year it's upon us already. I think we're we're in a kind of a planning mode because it's really a big change. Um, and so uh, I would think it's around 2026 that I imagine this coming online. Uh, thank, thank you, Martin, and, and thank, thank you, everyone, for your questions. It's really um, this is meant to be an hour, and we have to wrap up things now. So, Maud, I'm just wondering, in in closing, is there anything else you'd like to share with our audience? Oh, um, I always so I, I really want to say thank you. I, I can't easily read the 
uh, comments on the margins when I'm talking. So I know other people will send me your thoughts uh, later and I'll be able to see if folks had things to say. But I just I do just want to recognize that this is a challenging time. And one of the reasons I love being at Williams is that um, this is a, a, a hugely supportive community. Um, it's a hugely supportive community in a challenging time. Uh, and it's been a challenging time. We're dealing with global challenges right now. The pandemic was extremely challenging. There's just been a lot of um, uh, sort of upheavals, and those are upheavals really do um, kind of uh, we we can't stand aside from them. Colleges and universities are in the society, and we are affected by them. Um, and so, I just want to end by saying that I can do what I do here because of you, because of the support of alumni, even when you disagree with me and parents. Um, you know, you're part of my own ongoing conversations and education, and part of so much a part of what makes Williams the special place that it is. So, I want to thank you for your time and your. Uh, commitment to this institution and whatever your relationship is to it. Um, and I look forward to seeing you here at some point uh, in the months uh, ahead. Thank you. Oh, great. Again, and, and our apologies uh, if we didn't able to uh, to answer and, and ask the, the questions, but uh, we really tried uh, to do uh, uh, the grouping that we did. Maude, thank you not only for appearing today, but also for the amazing work that you accomplished during your tenure, and particularly in these past few years. I, I'm just stunned that you could cover all the topics that we presented to you today. So we really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. On behalf of all of us in the Williams family, I, I wanna say thank you for all you do. And we consider ourselves deeply fortunate having you lead our college. Please know that we're here for you just as you are here for all Williams alumni and families. And to those in the audience, uh, many, many thanks for joining us today. I hope to see you at homecoming this weekend, um, or if not at another in-person or even a virtual event down the line. So be well and thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Brent. Great to see you as always. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.